back. It's my pleasure to introduce our next lecturer. <coughs> it's uh, Rob Silversmith, and he'll speak to us about cross rations and pepper cloning. Okay. Uh, thanks very much to the organizers. Um, I'm really happy to be in Brazil for the first time. Um, and so today, I would like to tell you about a uh, kind of combinatorial problem that comes out of algebraic geometry. So the starting point um, is that, so we, we, we recall that the group of Mobius transformations acts on P1, which I'll often write using uh, complex number notation. So, so by, by, by exactly this for some element of PGL2. So we have this group action and it has the kind of key property that it is simply three transitive. So in other words, if you take a three tuple of distinct points in order in P1, then you can find a unique Mobius transformation that sends those three points in order to infinity, zero, and one, or alternatively to whatever other three tuple of points you choose. Um, okay, and so to, to kind of state this in the language that I'm gonna be using, this is just to say that any two three tuples of points in P1 are indistinguishable. You can identify any of them by, by an automorphism of P1. Or alternatively, if you were to look at the space of distinct three tuples of points in P1 up to automorphism, that space consists of a single point, because there's just one equivalence class. And that space I'll call M03. OK, on the other hand, if we work with four tuples of points in P1, then classically, we have this quantity called their cross ratio, defined by this rational function. Um, and it takes in four points and outputs a point of P1 that's not equal to 0, 1, or infinity. And what is it? Well, it's just you take your first three points, z1, z2, z3. You use the unique Mobius transformation that exists that sends them to infinity, 0, and 1 in order. And you see where the fourth point goes. And it goes to this expression. You can just compute it very explicitly. OK, and so this, um, this quantity, the cross ratio of these four points, is an invariant, a Nermobius transformation that essentially follows from what I just said. And really, um, all we've done is for each four tuple, we've, we've kind of put it in a normal form. In the form, we've used a, an automorphism to put it in the form infinity, zero, one, lambda, and we could do that uniquely. So this really is just a way of, of completely classifying four tuples. Okay, they all look like infinity, zero, one, lambda for some lambda, zero, one, or infinity, and as I vary that lambda, I get the whole space P1 take away zero, one, and infinity. Okay, so distinct four tuples are not all equivalent up to automorphism, and we can say exactly what their space is. They live in P1 take away three points. Okay, and I can generalize very easily to n tuples. Um, I can use exactly the same trick. I can take an n tuple of points, take the first three by some Mobius transformation to infinity, zero, and one, and then the others just go where they go. And where do they go? Well, they go to um, n minus three ordered points in P1. None of them are equal to infinity zero or one because the points are all distinct, and none of them are equal to each other. So to say that equivalently, M0n, the space of distinct n tuples, is isomorphic to P1 take away three points to the n minus three minus all the diagonals. Okay, so this is a smooth affine variety as presented of dimension n minus three. And it has a nice set of global coordinates. So um, I mean, if you tell me these n minus three cross ratios, that uniquely um, gives a point of M0n. Okay, so the question that I wanna focus on in this talk, which I will motivate a little bit later, is to what extent can we write down other uh, lists of cross ratios that of length n minus three to replace this and still get coordinates on, M, on M0n? Okay, so to, to state that in an example, I'm just gonna write down a list of 
four tuples of elements of one through eight. In this case, I've chosen n to be eight. So I can take the cross ratio of z1, z2, z3, z4, z1, z2, z3, z5, but then just some random looking things. One, one two, six, seven, three, four, six, eight, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, if I give you an eight tuple of points in P1, then these expressions produce five complex numbers, and I can kind of ask for the preimage of that. So in other words, if I constrain these five cross ratios to have fixed random complex values, then I can ask, how many points do I get? So I'm, I'm intersecting each of these equations, then gives me uh, um, a co-dimension one condition on M0n. So I'm intersecting n minus three hypersurfaces in an n minus three dimensional variety. In my kind of simpler case, I knew, I knew that I just got a unique point, but here maybe I should expect to get finitely many points. And so the kind of question is going to be how many points is it? Is it finite and how many points? Okay, and so in, in this particular example, which is going to be a running example, one can just plug these equations into Mathematica or, or your favorite computer software and ask it to solve them. And you're solving a system of polynomial equations, so you expect to get really nasty looking solutions, and you do. So in this case, Mathematica will think for a few minutes and then give you three solutions, and they're very long to write. They have lots of nested radicals. Okay, but the answer in this case is three. So now, to just kind of say the general form of the problem, I'll introduce this shorthand so to stop writing out this cumbersome expression all the time. I'm going to fix a bunch of four tuples of elements of one through n, n minus three of them, and I'll call script t just the collective data of that list. Okay, then we get a map from m0n to p1 take away three points to the n minus three that just takes in an n tuple and returns the corresponding n minus three cross ratios. So it re returns n minus three complex numbers. And this is a map from an n minus three dimensional variety to an n minus three dimensional variety. You expect it to be finite to one. And if you translate, the question that I asked before is exactly if I fix a random point in here and ask what is the cardinality of the preimage, it's the same question. That's, that's, that's what, I'm, what I'm asking, which is exactly the same as saying, well, this, if this is a map from an n minus three dimensional variety to an n minus three dimensional variety, what is its degree? Okay, and furthermore, you know, I'm not so interested in computing individual, cross, in, individual degrees of these maps. Um, there are ways to do it that I'll touch on a little later, but what I really want to know is how does this depend on the combinatorial input? Okay, this script T, which is this list of, of which cross ratios you're constraining. Okay, and these numbers are called cross, I, I'm calling cross ratio degrees. So again, the combinatorial input is this list, script T, of a bunch of four tuples, and the output is a non-negative integer. And it could be zero, you know, potentially this map is not actually dominant. Maybe it maps into a subvariety, in which case the degree would be zero. Okay, so here are a bunch of examples. There's the running example that we already saw. Okay, there's the kind of simplest example where we know that the cross ratios actually do give coordinates. So that says that that map is an isomorphism, it's degree one. Here's an example where the degree, the cross ratio degree can be zero. Um, which we'll go into also a little bit later. And then here's just a random example. So you can just ask a computer to compute lots of these and you get lots of different numbers. Here's one where you get seven. Okay, so in, oops, sorry. in order to um, kind of try to start answering this question, I want to uh, introduce a little bit more terminology. So other ways of thinking about this data of script T. Here's, here it is in my running example. It's this list of four tuples of, of one through eight. But I can also represent it equivalently by a matrix or by a bipartite graph. So I can take a matrix, have a column for each element one through eight, and a row 
for each of my four tuples, and then just put a one if that element is contained in that four tuple. So here, for example, T4, that row contains three, four, six, and eight, corresponding to three, four, six, eight. Okay, similarly, I can have a bipartite graph where one partite set is one through eight. The other bipartite graph is the list of uh, four tuples. And I just connect, you know, here is T4 gets connected to three, four, six, and eight on this side. So these are totally equivalent, just kind of pictorial representations of the same data. Okay, and then the, the big question is, can we describe this, invent, this invariant combinatorially? So can we describe these cross-ratio degrees in a combinatorial way based on the, the input script T? And what does combinatorial mean? Well, maybe that's a fairly flexible thing, but one thing that it might mean is in terms of, say, existing familiar invariants that we know about for a bipartite graph. And that's where I'll go. Okay, um, any questions at this point? Okay, so let me say a few basic properties, combinatorial properties that, this, that these numbers satisfy. By definition, they're all non-negative integers. Here's one that uh, is not immediately obvious, but it's easy to prove, that if you have one of your marked points, z1 through zn, that gets left out of every four tuple, then the cross ratio degree is automatically zero. Okay, so in, in terms of the matrix, what this says is that some column is all zeros. Uh, so something like this, and you see that six does not appear in any of the four tuples. That always implies, basically because your, your map is, is gonna factor through a smaller dimensional variety, so it can't be finite to one. Um, that implies that the cross ratio degree is zero. I'll rephrase it as just saying that the matrix has a column of zeros. Okay, here's another one, which I'll, I'll again stay, say in terms of the matrix. If you have a column of your matrix that has a single one and the rest are all zeros, then you can delete that column and that row, get a smaller matrix corresponding to a smaller cross ratio degree problem, and the, same, the answer will be the same. So this is a recursion. It's not a recursion that you can use to reconstruct all of them because generically you don't expect, this is a pretty special condition that you have a, a column with only a single one in it. Um, but it does allow you to do some recursive calculations. Okay, and then lastly, this is a generalization of that column of zeros condition. Actually, if you have a submatrix of zeros whose dimensions add up to size n minus two, then that implies that the cross ratio is zero. So in this case, we don't have a column of four by one submatrix, but we do have a three by two submatrix of zeros. That implies that, uh, that the cross ratio degree will be zero. Okay, so, um, and a, an interesting note that I'll, that I'll make is that this, whether this last condition is an if and only if is somewhat interesting. It's, a, it's an open problem. I've worked on it some, and some other people have also worked on it um, and related it to kind of some unknown things about matroids. Um, and the kind of only thing that is known is that if you happen to have a single, some column that contains all ones, then this is an if and only if. That's a, uh, follows from a result of Kastrovit and Tavolev. Okay, so I wanna talk more about this property four, the one about the submatrix of zeros, um, and relate it to matching theory. So um, this, is a, this is a definition from kind of classical combinatorics of bipartite graphs, um, but it's maybe not super familiar, so let me explain it. The surplus of a bipartite graph is calculated as follows. So here's a bipartite graph. For any subset of the vertices on the left, like the, these two red, I can calculate the size of the neighborhood, which is the six green vertices, and take the difference, six minus two, and I get, in this case, four. That's the surplus of this subset. To define the surplus of the bipartite graph, I take the minimum of that quantity 
over all non-empty subsets on the left side. Okay, and this is a classical condition because it, uh, oh yeah, let me say this first. Okay, so notice here that we are working with graphs that have, um, that have valence four for all of the left vertices. And so that immediately implies, just by taking a single element subset over here, its neighborhood will have four elements. So this min, some of the terms appearing in this min are gonna be three, four minus one. And so the, the highest our surplus can be is three. And it turns out that actually having surplus exactly three as opposed to less is equivalent to property four, this, this no submatrix of zeros of size adding up to n minus two. Okay, so, so we've restated the, uh, this matrix property in a nice way in terms of the bipartite graph. Um, and so property four says that if the surplus is, less, is strictly less than three, then the cross ratio degree is zero. If it's equal to three, then the cross ratio degree may be non-zero and conjecturally is non-zero. And if it's less than three, then it's equal to, then, it's, then it must be zero. Okay, so why is this surplus, um, why is this definition like classically useful? Because it comes up in Hall's theorem, one of the most famous theorems in combinatorics, um, on, on matchings. Okay, and so what Hull's theorem says, as, as you know, many of you will remember, if you, especially if you've taught combinatorics recently, is that um, a bipartite graph like this admits a matching if and only if it has posit a non-negative surplus. Okay, so this is, this is really just a generalization of, of Hull's condition. So uh, let me just remind you, a matching is, you know, for each, for each vertex on the left, you, you pick a vertex on the right with no duplicates. So it's an injection that, uh, such that every element is connected by an edge to its image. Okay, and so the, the reason, you know, like what, what this is hopefully leading us towards, what Hall's theorem is, is telling us is that there's a connection between the surplus of a graph and something about matchings on that graph. And so maybe it's a reasonable guess that we should be able to express our cross ratio degree, which we know is non-zero only if the surplus is equal to three. Maybe we can express that in terms of somehow counting matchings. Okay, so that's, that's essentially the, the thing that I am not quite going to succeed in doing, but it's the content of the theorem that I wanna tell you about. So just to introduce notation, I'm, it, it's often gonna be important to take this graph and delete three vertices on the right side so that we have the same number of vertices on both sides. Um, and so I'll, I'll just introduce this, this notation for deleting the I1, I2, and I3 vertices. And then the theorem is as follows. So for any choice of three vertices on the right side, delete them, and now you have a graph, a bipartite graph, count the number of matchings of that bipartite graph, and that will give you an upper bound for the cross ratio degree corresponding to this bipartite graph, D sub T. Okay, so, um, right, let's, let's see this a little bit in, um, the, in the example, the running example. So here we know that the cross ratio degree is gonna be three, now, I'm supposed to choose three vertices, three, three elements of one through eight to delete. So there are quite a few choices. There's eight choose three, which I think is 56 approximately. Um, and for each of those choices, I can then count the number of perfect matchings, which Hall's theorem guarantees that they exist. And I get these 56 numbers Okay, and as you see, three does show up. So if we, if we take the minimum, we, we do actually get three. And so in this case, for this example, um, the theorem actually provides not just an upper bound, but the correct answer. Okay, so, uh, so of course, it's natural to wonder how good an upper bound is this, and that's what this histogram is supposed to kind of 
hint at. So um, I, I just calculated a random, uh, oops. I, I calculated for a bunch of randomly chosen t the cross ratio degree for n equals 15. I, this is correspond, I, I think there are like maybe 10,000 examples or so represented here. And um, what I am, the, what the axes correspond to the upper bound that you get from the theorem versus the correct answer. Okay, so the, the fact that there's no data on the left side of the picture says that the theorem is correct, or seems to, appears to be correct, that, uh, that it actually is an upper bound. And the, if, if it always gave the right answer, that would say that the data would all be concentrated along the middle line. It's not, sometimes there is stuff off to the right, but it is mostly fairly close to the middle line. So it gives you some idea that it's a reasonably good upper bound. Okay, so the, the last thing, I mean, the, what I wanna do with my remaining time is say a little bit about the proof and then talk a little bit about the motivation and also relation to other work. So um, the kind of, the, the, the proof is interesting because it essentially doesn't contain any combinatorics. It's, it's a fully geometric, algebra geometric proof. And the kind of, one of the key steps is to reinterpret this cross ratio degree instead of just kind of, you know, counting solutions to this system of polynomial equations to, um, to count instead embedded rational curves um, that have a particularly nice form. So, you know, they're, they're rational curves in P1 to the N minus three, and their multi-degree is just one, 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 one. So they have all of these coordinate projections in any direction that are all isomorphisms. Okay, and so again, here's the running example. And here's the kind of problem that it gets translated to. So in P1 to the five, I can choose a bunch of generic complex numbers and build a bunch of, build a list of subvarieties coming from the matrix. And the way that you do it is you look at row one, okay, which has ones in, uh, in positions one, two, and three. And so then you just constrain the coordinates, A, B, and C, and let the last two coordinates vary. And that defines a subvariety. In fact, it's just a copy of P1 squared that's linearly embedded inside of P1 to the five. You do this for every column, and you get eight, in this case, different subvarieties of possibly different dimensions. And then you count the number of curves of this type of, of uh, you know, rational curves of this multi-degree that pass through all of those subvarieties. So this is like a classical kind of incidence counting problem. Um, and the answer, you can argue is that, is that this counting problem actually has the same answer as the other problem. It's, it's exactly d sub t. Um, and if you like, you know, this is, I mean, this problem is exactly how you define gromov witten invariance. So there's, for those of you who are into that, that kind of algebraic geometry, it, it's, a, it's an example of it. Okay, so where does this get us? You know, we've, we've reinterpreted the problem but now we need to figure out how to do this kind of geom geometric counting problem. And maybe I'll just note that it's, th this is kind of, we, we have done a non-trivial translation here. We were starting out by intersecting n minus three hypersurfaces in this n minus three dimensional variety. Now we're intersecting instead n subvarieties of various dimensions in, um, in a variety of dimension three n minus 12. So it's, I mean, we've done something with this translation. It's not exactly clear. Um, oops, sorry. Okay, so, right, so, so, so what does this get us? In order to get anything out of this translation, we need a decent way of actually counting these embedded curves. So luckily, gromov witten theory and other developments in algebraic geometry over a long time have given us a lot of good tools for solving exactly this kind of problem. So the standard way that one might solve this kind of problem is you take the space of embeddings of P1 into P1 to the N minus three with the appropriate multi-degree, 
That's not a compact space, but there's a very nice compactification called Kinsevich space, or the space of stable maps. Um, and if you have a compactification and you want to intersect a bunch of subvarieties, then you can use these kind of topological techniques to do it. So we are trying to intersect a bunch of subvarieties corresponding the con to the condition that we want our curve to pass through all of those subvarieties that I wrote down. So inside of P1 to the n minus 3, each of those imposes a condition on this moduli space, so a subvariety of this moduli space that we want to, we want to intersect all of them. Okay, and so what we can do is um, we can, for each of those subvarieties, we can take its Zariski closure in this space. That Zariski closure will have some cohomology class associated to it. And then there is an intersection product on the cohomology ring that, um, that we can, oh, sorry, this should say not in the cohomology of n, but in the cohomology of the compactification. And if you compute the intersection product, then that is in some way expected to give you the number of intersection points of those Zariski closures. Um, and in fact, in this case, you can prove that it does give you exactly the right answer. Okay, so the problem is that for this particular compactification, the combinatorics gets very difficult. And so in theory, you know, you could use this to get not just an upper bound on d sub t, but to get the exact answer in a nice combinatorial way. But it's somehow the combinatorics is too difficult in, in that I was unable to, um, to keep track like, you, you, can, you can carry this out for a specific choice of t, but I couldn't do it in a way that kind of, where, that allows you to keep track of the dependence on script t, which is really the point. Okay, so I opted for something easier that only gives you an upper bound, and that's this. So this space n is, it's a space of these embedded curves, but it's actually, uh, because it's, embedded curves of such a particularly nice type with this multi-degree, you can identify it explicitly as just PGL2 to the n minus 4. Um, and so I don't want to go into how exactly you do that, but um, it's, it's elementary. It just comes from the coordinate projections, and it's a non-canonical isomorphism. There's some choice involved. Okay, and PGL2 to the n minus 4, that's 2 by 2 matrices up to scaling, invertible. And so we have a very natural way to compactify it. It just lives inside of P3 to the n minus 4, where you add in matrices that are not necessarily full rank. Um, and this is very, I mean, this is very nice and simple. You can try to do exactly the same thing. You calculate the intersection number. And P3 to the n minus 4 is such a simple space that we can write down its cohomology ring completely explicitly. It's just a tensor product, n minus fourth tensor product of the cohomology ring of P3. And so we can actually keep track of the combinatorics. We can calculate these, you know, what these intersection numbers are while maintaining the, you know, maintaining the dependence on, on script T. Okay, now, then the question is, you know, any time you do one of these cohomological intersection number calculations in algebraic geometry, you then have to, like, worry afterwards about, like, well, does it actually give me the right answer? So now the, kind of, the question is, what is this intersection number actually telling us? It tells us the expected um, number of intersection points of all of these subvarieties. But in fact, in this case, again, things are nice enough that you can write down some kind of transversality argument that says that the intersection number does give you the correct answer. Okay, so inside of P3 to the n minus 4, we have all of these closed subvarieties that we're intersecting, and the number of intersection points is finite and is equal to what it's supposed to, you know, what, what this calculation gives us, this combinatorial calculation. Okay, unfortunately, some of these intersection points might occur not inside of 
PGL2 to the n minus 4, where we want them to be, but inside of the boundary, the stuff that we've added in artificially. And in fact, you can't get away from this problem. This is exactly why you don't always get the right answer uh, from, from this calculation. So no matter how generically you choose those, those sub-varieties with the kind of random coefficients in them, you still might be forced to have intersection points occurring in the boundary. OK. And so we only get an upper bound because the intersection number is the actual number of intersection points, but some of them occur on the boundary. You have to subtract those off to get the correct answer that we're looking for. OK. And, and, and then the kind of the only step where the combinatorics comes in is that when you actually carry out this intersection product, you're working again in just a very simple ring, the cohomology ring of P3 to the n minus fourth tensor power. When you calculate it, it is precisely the number of perfect matchings in script T take away three points, three, three vertices. Uh, where which three vertices are, that they are is, is dependent on uh, this, this isomorphism, the choice of, the, of which I said was non-canonical. OK, so um, that's all I want to say about the proof. Now I want to go back and say kind of where, where do these cross-ratio de degrees come from and how else can, can one try to compute them? So um, the, the first thing, which is maybe kind of was hiding in the background this whole time, is that what I've described here was not really the most natural way to try to compute these things, this going, going via like you know, embedded gromov witten theory, um, algebraic geometry, enumerative geometry. Um, the much more natural thing to do would be to work inside M0n bar, okay, which is like a compactification of M0n that I think I can say is probably, should be everyone's favorite compactification of M0n. Um, and that compactification, so it, it, inside of M0n, remember, we're just intersecting these n minus 3 hypersurfaces. So we could try to do the same strategy where you compactify M0n to get M0n bar, and then you multiply these things in the cohomology ring of M0n bar. Um, and this is, again, it's doable for specific values of script T. Um, the cohomology ring of M0n bar is extremely well studied. Sorry is extremely well studied um, since the early 90s. And there are all sorts of presentations known and Grobner bases for this ring known. Um, but when you actually try to compute these cross-ratio degrees, the combinatorics becomes incredibly difficult. And the, re the basic reason for this is that in this ring, in these presentations, you have relations with just a huge number of terms. The number, the number of terms grow in, in the relations grows extremely fast. And so if you try to kind of take the classes and then express them all in terms of some nice basis, you just get these enormous expressions that you don't really know what to do with combinatorially. OK, so I, anyway, this is a strategy that I was not able to carry out for how to compute these things. Um, OK. and then. So I also want to point out a connection to some other work, uh, some other recent work. So another way of saying, of, of describing cross-ratio degrees is as the, um, is as the multi-degree of a particular embedding of M0n or M0n bar, where you simply take a point in M0n, say, which is just n, an n-tuple of points on P1, and you record all of the cross-ratios. Okay, so all of the n choose four cross-ratios for every four tuple of points. Um, and so you get this embedding of M0n into a very large dimensional space, and it has a, a multi-degree because it lives in a product of projective spaces. And the data of that multi-degree is precisely the same as the data of every cross-ratio degree uh, for that fixed n. Okay, and so the reason I say, the, the reason I bring this up is that there's other work recently on, um, on degrees of natural embeddings of M0n or M0n bar, um, or multi-degrees, um, due to Cavalieri, Gillespie, Monin, and Gillespie, Griffin, Levinson, 
that are also kind of similarly combinatorial in nature and which I'll talk about a com common generalization with in, in my last minute, just not quite yet. Okay, and then, and then I said that I would touch on the original motivation. So these cross-ratio degrees arise when you're trying to find coordinates on this compactification M0 N bar that are defined in a neighborhood of some kind of fixed thing in the boundary. So I said that you have you know, these global coordinates on M0N, just this particular list of cross-ratio degrees, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 5, and so on. But uh, if you want co coordinates that actually are defined on the boundary, then you might have to use a different set of cross-ratios. And when you try to write down whether or not this is possible at arbitrary boundary points, you run into these cross-ratio degrees. Okay. Okay, so and that's the last thing which I want to mention. So, um, the last thing that I want to say is I just want to advertise a kind of more recent related project, which is um, coming from tropical geometry. So most of the story that I've told today, not the, not the proof, but everything else, can be rephrased in terms of tropical geometry. So M0N has a polyhedral analog called M0N trop, which is a moduli space of marked metric trees. And it exists, it, there, there's such a thing as a tropical cross-ratio, and you can, you can ask exactly the same question, where you know, the cross-ratio gives you a map to the analog of P1 to the N minus 3, and you ask for the degree of that map. Okay, and the, the pictures that come up look something like this, so you have some polyhedral complex. This is really just a small piece of M06 trop mapping down to some other polyhedral complex in a way that kind of looks finite to one. So this one, it almost looks two to one, except that on that middle triangle, there's just a single pre-image. I hope that the picture makes sense. Um, so down, if you, if you take the pre-image of a point kind of right in the middle of this triangle, you only get a single point. But that point, there's this notion of tropical multiplicity that takes care of it. So th those, those points in the middle actually should be counted with multiplicity two. Okay, so using this kind of tropical formulism, Christoph Goldner came up with a really nice combinatorial algorithm, which is actually how I generated all of that data um, for finding cross-ratio degrees, where basically you look at a picture just like this, and you choose some really, uh, you choose some really carefully chosen point downstairs, and you look at its pre-image upstairs. And you know, because you, you chose just the right point downstairs, it's, it's kind of easy to, to calculate everything in the pre-image. Um, Oh yeah, there. Okay, so um, the, the last thing I wanna advertise is this theorem that's like just being finished right now with Sean Griffin, Jake Levinson, and Rohini Ramadas, where we generalize this algorithm to a kind of more, uh, more general class of, of intersection numbers that also, so it, it generalizes, it's a common generalization of both cross-ratio degrees and those other degrees that Cavalieri, Gillespie, Monin, Griffin, Levinson studied. And we come up with a kind of tropical framework for a very general class of uh, intersection computations of this form. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening.